The Ring series began in Japan with uh, Ringu, and was a smash hit with its creation of folklore-based icon Sadako, a badass vengeance ghost called Yurei in Japan. The Ring series was adapted for Western audiences with the release of The Ring in 2002, a pretty good horror film directed by Gore Verbinski that introduced us Western-ass gaijins to the basic elements of Sadako's vengeance. Just one, watching the cursed tape will trigger your doom timer. Two, you'll get a call on the phone and the voice will say, seven days. And three, seven days later you'll die after she does some cool ghost shit to you. Concept super straightforward. Sadako is a badass villain and given these basic elements it's hard, nay, impossible to fuck up. Oh my god. Rings is a 2017 horror film directed by F. Javier Gutierrez and is the latest in the Ring film series. It manages to fuck up what might be one of the easier movies in the world to shoot, a Ring film. All of the elements are there, Javier. Just make something semi-coherent and throw in some cool effects, people will be happy. Unfortunately, coherence always was Javier's greatest enemy. If you've seen any of the advertising for this movie, you were probably pretty hyped. The trailer contains all of the super important scenes from the movie, including the fucking ending, and they even had to shoot extra shit for the trailer because of how lacking this movie is in cool stuff. The movie pissed me off because it disappointed me really badly. The ads are really cool, and hey, Sadako is fucking badass. I love the Unreal Vengeance ghost shit. It's my favorite. My Hisako win rate is nasty in KI. Well, F Javier really effed up here. <laughs> Let's talk about it. So we open on a dude's sweaty neck on an airplane. Must be a luxury jet considering the shit screens I've seen in Delta Coach. He's in the fit of some crack shakes when a lady hits on him. Life sucks when you can't sleep. Then he's like, You ever hear about the videotape that kills you after you watch it? Hmm, dude, your pickup lines are trashed here. You open with, hey, fly often. Then you hard transition into, hey, you seen that movie that kills you after seven days? He awkwardly tells her that he has five minutes left before the clock strikes seven days and she turns to her friend like, what the fuck was that? The dude's freaking out as his crack shakes worsen and her friend is like, I've seen that video too. I've seen it. And for some reason, all of the screens on the plane are changing to the ring. Did everyone on the plane see the video, including the pilots? Worse than that, did everyone on the plane watch the video at the exact same time? What are the logistics of Samsara's killing techniques? If a thousand people watch the video, does she have to kill them all at the same time? If they watch the video within a couple minutes of each other, does she have to go in order? If she's going in order to kill people, does she have to make a new badass entrance every time? Or could she walk up to the crack shakes, kill him, walk over to the next lady, etc.? We find out soon after that this plane did not Dean crashed killing a bunch of people, so was it a giant fucking coincidence that the plane crashed while the dude was being killed by Samsara? Don't worry though, literally none of these questions will be answered by movie's end. We get three frames of Samsara climbing out of the pilot's TV. Boom, two years later. So this guy buys a VCR and finds a cursed tape within. He watches the tape from the old movies and they actually got the aspect ratio right, which is a cool detail. Samsara calls him to tell him he's dead in seven days and see, this effect right here is a running theme in the movie. Some cool visual tricks that put together with a decent plot would make this enjoyable. I'm not sure I understand the symbology of upwards rain, but again, looks cool. Title sequence. This is where we meet our main character, who will affectionately be calling main character until we get her name. Her boyfriend is in bed with her, and they're whispering sweet nothings to each other. I just I relate to the guy. I can't imagine not looking back at you. <laughs> I think this is the type of shit you could relate to if anyone loved you, so I'll just call it lame instead. God, they're so cute together and interesting, and he tells her the story of Orpheus, which is like so deep. Actually, you gotta go. Because my boyfriend's leaving for college, and I promised. This guy's a fucking freshman? What the fuck kind of milk are kids drinking these days? Ha, the alarm's at 707, get it? Like seven days? Like seven is the number of days at Sapsara, seven, seven, seven. Well, we got this guy's name, which is fucking Holt. What a fucking Holt, dude. Look at this asshole. Such a Holt move to strip in the middle of your suburban neighborhood and then yell at his dad like a goddamn sociopath. Sure. Tonight! And every night! And every single night! Oh my, oh my, oh my. So Holt's gone off to college, 
main character stuck in town taking care of her mother or something. It looks like they're on some kind of Adobe video chat and since the Adobe cloud is overstuffed with shit, I won't question whether they have their own Skype now. Dude, you know who sucks who we haven't seen in this movie yet? Minorities. And we get two for the price of one. Solo lady, but boyfriend's got plans tonight. You know, but they're corrupting our white sociopathic youth, I tell you. How can the Holtz of today be safe with urban people around? At this point, she's worried about the fact that Holt hasn't talked to her recently, and really, he's been running with the wrong crowd, it seems. Some random calls main character from Holt's Adobe Skype. See, these are shitty effects. Whoa, dude, her face looks so weirdo grossy. So naturally, main character gets worried and decides to call Holt to find out what the flip is going on here. What a Holt answering message. Dude, this guy is so fucking Holt, it hurts. So now main character is the Orpheus to Holt's waifu. And she makes a trek to college to save him after that rando Adobe Skype call freaks her out. Sometimes you get ghosted by your longtime Holt boyfriend, dude. Times are tough. Move on. But main character is like, fuck that. I'm gonna break into his dorm. She starts going through all of his shit when she finds his phone. How long has it been down there? Pretty lucky it's at 1%, otherwise this movie would have to end right now. Oh, so her real name's Julia. Thanks, phone. So Julia sees a class highlighted on his wall and is like, that's where I'll find Holt for sure. Turns out the professor of this class is the guy who watched the tape from earlier. This is the type of lecture where he happens to say something relevant to the plot. Something like, biochemistry is interesting. And so are ghosts, right? The fuck is this interaction? Hey, I remember you guys from- Why do you come here? Come on, dude. Move along, there you go. There you go. This shit won't make sense in hindsight either. Julia goes to talk to the professor after class and asks him about Holt. He tells her to move on from Holt. But would Holt move on from her, dude? You know? Like, I mean the answer is yes, obviously. But, you know, she mean mugs the professor to death and then goes to take gumshoe on him, hiding in the crevices of the hallway and shit. Julia's on a mission to save her Orpheus-esque waifu from the clutches of this dickhead professor. Turns out the professor is on floor seven. Like seven days? Like the amount of days you get before Samsara seven, 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 seven. How'd she know to grab that key? It reminds me of like horror games where you pick up random shit that you wouldn't pick up or have any idea what to do with in real life. Like in Resident Evil, you pick up random rubies and shit and then you use them on intricate puzzles later. How did you know you need that later out of all the random shit you could have picked up? If I were starting this movie, firstly, I would have moved on from Holt because fuck that. But if I was there, I'd be like, fuck. And there'd be a collection of scenes of me breaking into the dorm again just to get the key. She gets off the elevator and I think we're still at the college, but maybe it's like a floor of the science building that this guy owns or some shit because there's a creepy ass video camera set up and a whole host of other creepy shit. She finds a den of filth, probably called the den of filth by the edgy assholes who live there. On the wall is a collection of fucked up photographs including what? Holt? Man, this argument is full of a lot of relevant information. Everyone says that. It's okay. Where's your tail? I don't have one anymore. I told you not to call him. That there's a tape you need to make, copy and so on and so forth, thank you. Julia follows the rando who Adobe Skyped her before back to her place with promises of Holt related information. You live here? Nah, it's just a random apartment I have keys to. The fuck would you think she doesn't live there for? Be careful where you step, I just painted the ceiling. Fuck dude, you suck pretty bad at painting. You should probably stick to canvas. Rando sets her phone on the desk and Julia picks it up Yoink. and finds a text from the boy Holt saying not to watch the tape. Man, Julia's lucky she picked up Rando's phone, which Yoink. happened to be texted by Holt at the same time. And Holt believed it was Julia and told her not to watch. Fuck, man, what a beautiful set of quink dinks. But oh shit, Rando's too late anyways. The alarm goes off at 710, which means she's fucked. Is that TV 4K, dude? This whole segment though is pretty fucking cool. She pulls the fucking TV off the wall, but of course the TV's still on. Starts leaking black water goo and Samsara claws out of that shit in a badass sequence. It's subtle, but I appreciate they added a sound of the TV falling after Samsara gets out of it. One thing the sequence makes me wonder is, could you just physically close off all the screens around you to stop her from getting out? Like if Rando stood on the TV, would Samara have to deadlift Rando off the screen? Would you be any safer if you could somehow stash your TV or your phone or whatever in an industrial press or some shit? Rando gets 
fucked. And Julia spent this whole time listening to someone scream from the inside of the bathroom. But what would happen if she left the bathroom and just went out there to watch? Is she safe because she hasn't seen the video? Would she be able to sit there as a third party safe from death? We'll eventually find out Julia is special. But would any other third party be able to sit there and watch? Oh my god, Holt's come to save her. Holt tells us the professor is running some kind of ring movie watching scheme. Combine this with the fact that Julia said earlier that Holt is doing something for extra credit, we can surmise a few things. First, the professor is a gigantic fucking asshole recruiting kids into his den of filth by offering them better grades. Secondly, students are consenting to this because we've created an industry predicated on getting good grades in order to succeed in college, in order to literally succeed in life. It's really a commentary on the post-work society that capitalism thrives on. On the other hand, if you've taken a step inside of the den of filth, you see that there's some creepy wonky shit going on in there. The type of shit this professor did shit probably isn't sanctioned to be doing. Further, if you've seen the shit going on inside said den of filth and you'd see creepy ghost pictures of shit which turn you away from it completely. Or better yet, lead you to report this asshole for hijacking the entire floor of the institution for his death cult. How could you be so stupid, Holt? How could all of them be so stupid? But I guess the sales pitch was really good or something. Now Holt tells us the rules. First, watch the tape. Second, make a copy of the tape. Third, Show the copy to someone else who is called your tail. As soon as you've passed off the curse to your tail, I'm assuming you're safe, but it's not really clear. Holt here doesn't have a tail because everyone else dropped the fuck out as soon as news of Rando's death reached people, I guess. <laughs> Julia realizes Holt is fucked by this ghost spirit, so she opens up his copy of the movie. She went full screen too. Julia understands the importance of cinematic immersion. Some of the new footage in this version is ghost as fuck too. Yucky bugs and nails. She gets a call on their motel landline what a, what a cute phone holt then explains why he ghosted julia to protect her from the ghost videos or something why the fuck would your plan to protect your loving girlfriend someone who you're supposed to trust and discuss things with include not telling her anything like why in god's name would you specifically choose not to inform her of the danger or talk to her about all this Babe, I knew telling you would make you overreact. You realize your fucking moronic plan of protecting her by not telling her anything literally put her in danger and on this path. Your plan had the opposite effect. You're dumber than you look, Holt, and you look like a fucking idiot. So they're driving to get Julia's tail and Julia hallucinates a bird and the admin wants a semi truck on her position. And they're talking about how Rando's dead and somehow there's a picture of it online already. Damn millennials move quick when someone's gruesomely murdered. Julie is apprehensive about continuing the cycle, but like she knows that means she'd just die, right? And I can't tell if it works this way, but does the line travel backwards? Like in Final Destination, if death fails to kill you, it skips you for the time and circles back. This movie's making it seem like once you have a tail, then it's done, which would mean this shit wouldn't even stop until the last person. But I mean, who's considered a person to watch this? If I put a baby in front of the TV and slapped on the video, would the baby be cursed? Is there an age limit? Does it just stop spreading after the last person to watch it dies? Would you eventually get a government program forcing people to be tails for others? Much like how the government is already spiking the tap water with chlorine, they'd be forcing us to watch death videos. Julia fucking glitches the computer and her copy is apparently a gigantic file. Holt's like, I'm watching it with you and Julia says no, but he's like, I need to end a discussion. End of discussion. Then the professor is like, just let her watch it dude and Holt gives up immediately. He's got a real spirit about him, that Holt feller. Damn, boy. Damn, boy, he's thick, boy. That's a thick ass boy. Damn. Ba -ba! You know, primitive cultures believe that the only way to free a soul is to burn the body. Primitive cultures, hmm? The professor gets a call on his rotary. Apparently someone warned him that the police were on their way. The prof here acknowledges that he's essentially a murderer, and I like that, though he's still treated as a hero when he isn't. Dude, you set up a death cult. I don't think this falls under institutional review board ethics. He gives them his notes in Samara or something, and they're off. So they're driving around going through the professor's research notes and learn about Samara and whatever. Her history is that she was a weirdo and no one liked her, and then they threw her in a well, and so she lived there for her seven days until she died and that's why she wants vengeance or something. During this exposition we're getting reenactments of the events of Samar's life. That girl. What girl? That girl? What girl? Wow Javier, you're really breaking some horror ground here. Uh.
They're checking into a bed and breakfast, and the lady's telling her shit about her knees, and Julia's like... People say we look no, just... No, I'm sorry, I meant the girl with the violin. Ooh, shit, that was mean. Julia doesn't care about your niece, dude. They show up at the church or whatever, and there's some kind of meeting going on, but they're just walking around the meeting. Do churches usually have cross lighting? That's actually kind of cool. It makes it all Jesus-y and such. The worst thing about this movie is that it fucking shits an iconic franchise and wastes potential of one of the coolest characters in the world. But the second worst is that it's just fucking boring. Like, goddamn, recap on what's happened. Samara crashed the plane. A bunch of people watched the tape. Julia robbed Holt's apartment. Pick up the pace, Javier. Holt talks to a local who says pretty much nothing. Well, Julia's already figured out the next plot setting by looking at the birds. Them birds, man. They got a mind of their own. Meanwhile, the professor is trying to make his great escape from the coppers. The professor then has a shocking discovery and goes to call Holt when suddenly... Come on, pick up. This is Holt. You know what to do. God damn it, Holt, you fucking idiot. Try to the shit. Answer your fucking phone, you dweeb. So it's a fucking loose story, but basically, Julia is following all these visions in her head, which is the only thing driving the plot forward. Honestly, if you were looking for a lot of shit, you'd be looking for a long goddamn time unless the Lord hit you with the unblockable visions. I got pictures in my head, Holt. She's in there. How do you know, dude? Maybe you just desecrated the grave of a nun or something, you dipshits. They find no body in the tomb, so Julia decides to climb into the tomb to read some of the writing on the wall. Oh my god, Julia's written on the wall, and someone slams the stone tablet that didn't exist, locking her in. Samara's just hanging out behind Julia in frame. Spooky shit happens, and Holt saves the day. Whoa, hey, fucking ninja rule guy here in his jump scare, dog. <laughs> We followed Bushido around these parts. <laughs> hey, it's the Bagul guy from Sinister. The symbol is associated with a pagan deity named Bagul. 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 Uh, at this point, I don't really know what's going on. They're talking to Bagul, Bagul. guy about the town and Samara or whatever, and his big character trait is being blind. Fucking Zatoichi over here flipping its cane and chairs and shit. Bagul tells this long, deep, haunting story of his visions and shit while he was looking for Samara. And then I went blind. Oh man, feels bad. No more visions for you, dude. <laughs> Got him. He's basically telling her she isn't all that and whatever for seeing shit, because he did it too. Having a vision doesn't mean you know what that vision means. Whoa, whoa, yeah. Except like all the visions in this movie have just been literal things. She has a vision of a bunch of birds flying around and then she literally sees birds flying around. She has a vision of a literal church and then she just finds that exact same church. Where's the subtlety of these visions? There is none. Then he weirdly grabs her hand and reads what we discovered earlier was braille and his reaction is ominous. I think we're supposed to assume grabbing people's hands aggressively is a blind person thing or something. Like, oh, hey, there's something they do instead of a weird creepy thing. They leave Bagul guy and head off to figure out some other shit. They come across a closed road in what appears to be some kind of car crash. Julia! It's that girl from the picture! Hey, oh, oh, where do you think you're going, sir? Whoa, where do you think you're going, sir? Ma'am, you go on ahead. You're the focal point of this plot, but you're here with me, Holt. They realize the road is closed because the professor had a car crash or some shit. Wait. Wait, the professor's still in the fucking car? How do you have time to close the road, but he's still in the car? And alive, by the way, this fucker's alive, chilling upside down in his car while the fucking coppers dick around with the caution tape. The other ones fuck around with the truck. Where's the ambulance? What are you guys doing? Put your caution tape back in your pants, pendejos, and save this guy. After she asks for help, the first person to get to her is fucking Holt. These coppers are idiots. God decides he's had enough of this professor and electrocutes him. Wow, that was an incredibly avoidable death. You're doing good, please work guys luckily he showed up with enough time to point at her hand or whatever just like Bagul did he wanted to tell us something no she wanted to tell us something um and he wanted to tell you something too what <laughs> So they trek back to the motel and Holt offers to go get her food or something a convenient way to isolate Julia for plot reasons so what is that Chicken or steak? You're funny. 
God, Holt, you're such a fucking loser, and she knows it too. Just fuck off. You're asking too many questions, Holt. Just get the food and get back to Julia. Oh, wait, never mind. She's gone. So Julia breaks into the church and immediately starts destroying the church floor. She finds a secret compartment or something and goes deep into the unknown depths below. Man, how many people carry flashlights with them? It'd be more realistic for them to use one of those keychain lights instead of a full fucking mag light. Or hey, maybe use the light on her phone? We find out that, no shit, the town priest is a fucking evil scumbag. What a surprise! This one ranks like a step more evil than your average priest because he abducted a lady and sashed her beneath the sacred house of God. Jump scare. That lady's name? Samara's mother. Pretty weird that he was able to pull off an abduction like this right under the feet of his congregation. Really plain fire, priest. Especially since small town folks are known for their adept perception and adherence to Bushido. Julie goes to talk to the Bagul guy and learns a terrifying secret. The crazy priest from the story is Bagul guy, so he attacks her to keep his secret safe or something. Lucky for him that Holt's an idiot and went to eat chicken ribs or whatever with the bed breakfast lady. Chicken or steak? Fucking Holt, dude, you're so stupid. So she's fighting with the guy and Holt's meandering his way over. magul has gone full ape shit at this point and we find out he's Samar's dad. Julia shoves him down the stairs. Hey, where'd your mag light go? What is this phone light bullshit and why is it so good? Is it a mag light phone? So for a while, Julia's goal has been to free Samara. And what does this mean? We don't really know. But she finds Samara's bones in the wall. Bagul shows back up to kill Julia and Samara comes out of the phone and gives Bagul his sight back so she she can kill him. You grody. Why didn't this happen sooner though? Did I miss something about him hating phones? When he blinded himself, did he also decide never to go near a screen ever again? Does this mean Samara's legitimately only able to arrive through screens and shit? So she couldn't teleport into the house and give his sight back? She'd have to wait until the screen entered his house? But he's also said something about others trying to free Samara or whatever. Does that mean none of them ever brought their screens in? Hell, even Julia and Holt brought their phones to this house before. Why is Samara killing them at the climax of the movie? Shouldn't he already be dead? You were never afraid of her. I mean, Holt, I get the sentiment, but Julie was pretty afraid of her. Why would burning her bones free her anyways? How do you know that's a real solution? Where is this information coming from? We cut to a lovely bedtime that was almost certainly filmed at the same time the intro was. Holt finally looks at his fucking phone and gets the professor's information, which is like, wow, dude, take a look at your fucking phone and you'd save a lot of people a lot of hurt. Were you trying to keep the professor safe too? Is that why you were ghosting him? Holt's trying to figure out what the message was on Julie's hand. Meanwhile, Julie is picking her skin off in the shower and just generally having a hard time. R-E-B. Rebound. R rebellion. Re rebranding. Turns out it ain't none of those. It's Rebirth. Whoa, Rebirth. What is, oh, wait, never mind. It's Rebirth. So Samara's taking over Julia or something, and now she's mass sending out the video with her mind or some shit. I Meaning we're all getting a taste of that sweet, sweet death movie. The end. Watching this movie is a fucking endurance contest. It's so goddamn boring and shitty and there's no fucking tension the whole time to keep me awake. The characters are stupid as shit. The side characters are stupid as shit. The plot is threadbare. The only good things are the occasional good special effect or camera angle. And this shows in Rotten Tomatoes score for both critics and commoners, I mean audience. Here's the thing though, I think F. Javier has some talent. The filmmaking here isn't really that shitty. And some of the shots are actually really fucking cool. The main problem is the plot, which is boring as fucking fuck. F. Javier seems to fit better as a cinematographer than a director, since it seemed like none of the actors were really directed very well, and the movie often lacks coherence. At a certain level, it's not like other directors haven't already taken the Ring franchise to the cleaners. Very recently, The Ring vs. The Grudge came out in Japanese theaters, kinda a take on Freddy vs. Jason, except this time it's about the ghosts of dead children fighting each other. Pretty fucked, but hey, why not? It looks like a stupid piece of shit, but a fun piece of shit as well. So I don't really think this is a prestige franchise. At the same time, when you're making a movie based on the Ring series, it's good to understand why audiences are there in the first place. It definitely isn't to explore the motivations and hardships of the main villain. It's to have a good time seeing some scary shit. This movie actually has a lot in common with another movie I hate, Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Beginning. The stupid fucking thing both of these movies do is attempt to humanize their main villains. It's especially egregious with Texas Chainsaw because Leatherface wears a mask made of fucking human skin, but it also sucks here because who gives a shit? 
shit. I'm here to see Samara do some badass stuff, cursing random people and crawling out of TVs. Who cares if she was a nerd? This did pretty well at the box office, making 83 million off a 25 million dollar budget. There's life in the franchise, clearly, even if the people involved in this tried to bore everyone to death. In my Purge review, I said I'd be there day one for the Purge 4. I won't be there day one for the Ring 4. I think I'll wait for the, uh, digital version. Contrary to a lot of reviewers, I think there are some things to like here, but it's mostly things to not like. One out of five rings, but only because Samara is so fucking cool, goddammit.